allegory kind of deal for planet Welcome Earth. Welcome to the co-optional podcast. Oh, oh, oh. oh okay. Oh. <laughs> We've started. <laughs> yeah, hi, is- everyone. I mean, nobody pays attention to anything I say. It's fine. I'm sorry, I Jenna. Didn't it's okay. I say anything, and I wasn't even participating, so. You're fine. It's like in future, I just need a big sign. We're going to start now. No. Well, the, the, you, you can, Jack can help us out on this one. The movie Mother, is it about planet Earth? <laughs> yes. Allegory, it's an allegory it, for Earth. It's an allegory of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and how Earth has I been get, despoiled by That's the human weird. race. Yes. But I thought that, like... The mother character is supposed to be planet Earth, and all the weird yes. stuff that happens at the end was she's like Mother Nature, right. basically. That's yes, right. she's Mother Nature. That's right. Exactly. Right. All right. Okay. I'm feeling good about my. I, I haven't. I that's haven't, all like, you need to do. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's all I okay. want to know. Is that's what we were having a conversation about? Because that's a weird ass movie, and it I just is. wanted to make sure that my interpretation of that weird ass ending was correct. Yeah, it, I yeah, haven't seen it, so I guess I'll go into it with with special eyes. Yeah, you need I, them because I, that movie is bizarre. It re- kind of requires you to watch it again after you sort of come to the conclusion that oh, this is kind of what it was about. Then if you watch it again, other things will sort of make more sense. So it, it mm. deserves more than one viewing, in my opinion. Um, pa- you know, slammed by the critics, I think. But I think it was. That's what I was saying. Movie. I was like, I heard yeah. that it didn't do well, like yeah, at all. It didn't. But... Um, I think most people thought it's... it was you know J Law and you know Ed Harris and stuff. It was like oh. Oh, you know mm-hmm. these these Academy Award winning actors, you know, doing a weird movie. What? It, you know, sometimes it strikes people as different. Who knows? Mm. It's different and harsh. Like it's just. It is very harsh. It's it's just, it was disturbing at certain, at certain levels. The person I was watching with, she kept. I don't want to watch. She'd leave the room. I don't want to watch anymore. I drag her back. No, I don't want to watch it. Right. So I mean, yeah. it, it actually was driving mm. her out of the room. I yeah. It, I... It, oh, go the ahead. camera angles. I believe, mm. if I'm not mistaken, they never. Like it's always point of view stuff or yes. it's always like filmed from inside the house. It's mm-hmm. there's a lot going on there that's like uncomfortable. Yeah. I think yeah. a movie like that sort of has to be uncomfortable because if you're trying to get the point across that, you know, we as people are, you know, <laughs> spoiling our own environment, then perhaps things do need to be harsh. And they do need to be Sure. Yeah. I just that way. I would ra- I would rather the Captain Amer- like Captain Planet movie. <laughs> at least that's a little, it's like on the nose, but at least I'm not like weirded out the entire time. And then the message is like, hey, save the planet, Captain America, planet. Wait, Captain Planet. Whatever. Hi. I mean, I, I like to think that Captain America would also, you know, be about that, too. But sure. Captain Hell Planet yeah. by your powers combined. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Welcome to the Co-Optional Podcast, episode 229. Uh. <laughs> Like, I feel like I don't even need to do an intro anymore. It just doesn't need to happen. Um, <laughs> uh, today is October the 2nd, so we are officially into autumn, I guess. For those of you who have seasons, unless you live in the California Not here. area, <laughs> in, in which case there might be a slight cool breeze, maybe. And it has cooled down. I'll Depending on where that. you live. If you're more if you're more inland, you still are like in the desert. So ah, oh, true. Um, here we have seasons in North Carolina, so yeah, th- those are a thing. We're getting ramped up for all the people to be driving down I seventy seven to come look at the changing colors of leaves. That's a thing. I miss leaves changing so I much. Bet it's beautiful. I bet it's great. I feel like it could be simulated. I feel like you could VR that very easily and not miss out on anything. We've come but it's a not long the same. Way. <laughs> I want to. I want to like walk around and crunch on some leaves and stuff. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. You're that person. All right then. With your pumpkin spice latte and your yoga pants and your Uggs. No. You're describing my Friday night. Yes. <laughs> I didn't say redhead. I put on a wig. I put on a wig and some some yoga pants. Call it a Friday. That's me. Ah, like to welcome. Who was to our guest, Jenna? That, that I was just getting there. I on. was just getting there. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the show the man who really needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. For those of you who are not of our generation, you still should know who this man is. Uh, CEO of In Exile Entertainment, Brian Fargo. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on it. I appreciate it. Of course. 
Brian, of course, has been involved in pretty much any game that you can think of in one way or another. It's like the godfather, okay? Uh So it's like, pick a game. You know, it's like, if you picked, oh, well, Fallout. Oh, guess what? I can trace that back to Brian Fargo. (laughs) If you happen to like uh, games like Wasteland, Brian Fargo, right here. Uh, My favorite game of all time, and those of you who have followed me for years will know, Planescape Torment, my all-time most favorite game ever. That is my offline game. The internet goes out, anything happens, that is my go-to. I still have my original CD-ROM set. (laughs) So that is my game. Um, So yeah, Brian joins us here today to talk about some of the games that his company's been working on. Not not a very busy year for you guys at all, right? No big deal. <laughs> just another just another year yeah. game development. Yeah. You still have a yeah. studio that's active and operating though, so given our news that we covered last in last week's show, um, that that's actually something to be proud of. Yeah, no, I'm 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 fortunate that I, I'm still getting to do this after all these years. If you think, you know, I've been in this business since the eighties. And oh, yeah. um so our first, we did a game called Mind Shadow uh, with Activision way back in the day. And that was a graphic text adventure game uh, loosely based on the Born Identity by Robert Ludlow. You were, at, you were an amnesiac uh, in the game. Was that Alan were, Adam who, who did that one? Am Alan Adam. Am I who, thinking of the wrong person here? Well, so, so the, that particular title I worked with Michael Cranford on, who ended oh, up okay. doing Bard Cell. But Alan Adham, who was one of the founders well, that was of Blizzard, RPM Racing, wasn't it? No, no, but, but no, but no, but but Alan did some of the programming oh, on that. Oh, okay. He, I when he was still in high school, and his name was I. His name was Iman Adam, yeah. and so there was a connection to to right. to, uh, to him uh, for that game. So anyway, I've been doing ever since that. Bard still, Wasteland, Fallout, Kingpin, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a whole, whole bunch of them when i go on press tour sometimes you know some of the people i'll start they'll go oh what have you worked on and i'll start naming off some <laughs> games and then they'll look at me like i'm lying uh, <laughs> they just <laughs> don't know the history like a long list so it's always kind of funny and then i'll go interplay like nope i haven't heard of it you know or so anyway it, it's different audiences that i'll that i'll hit so but anyway but i'm very fortunate that i'm still i'm still able to do it because creating things is the best hmm and you've been in in the business for like what thirty years now, yeah. not more than that. Oh, I was born in eighty three. I should know this. I'm thirty five years old. <laughs> yes, Jenna, <laughs> you can do math. Well, yeah. So so uh, it, well, Interplay was eighty three. I believe eighty three. I graduated high school eighty one, eighty two. Yeah, right around eighty three. Yeah. Got in the game early. <laughs> I did. I knew what I wanted to do at a very young age. Although I look at what you guys are doing, it seems like kind of fun. I I, I don't know if I've been. If this would have been around, I would have enjoyed this. This would have been <laughs> If this would have been around back when we were teenagers, I think we probably would have been doing this too, maybe. <laughs> but then again, we probably wouldn't have gotten to play. Well, I don't know. Our job is kind of to play these games too. But I don't know. I feel like maybe maybe we have a different perspective on things, given that we were you know, sort of forced more to play games and not really share the experience, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's so... I, I, you know, I, I think that I've learned more or or got more in tune with the vibe and sensibility of streaming and podcasting over this last year than I really have before. Like I've been able to see the good and the, and and the bad and appreciate the good and the work that goes into it. And and I was saying earlier, there are similarities in that that, that both of us, there are, there are low bars to to do what you're doing and to do what I'm doing and how you help rise above so much of the, of of the noise. So we, we share, a similar thing in that regard, but I, I've, I've grown to really appreciate uh, again the, the effort and the power of what it is that you guys do. Well, thank well you. thanks. I, I, I feel like you're mistaken, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you hear you hear the word like media influencers or game influencers, and I don't know. There is part of me that kind of wants to cringe at that, but at the same time, like this is, this is my job now, so I need this. <laughs> I don't know. It's like if I could go back and and just play CRPGs all day, that would be great. But someone's got to pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> um. So let's see. Do you guys want to start with some news? Let's sure. See. 
<laughs> Lead us on. Nobody wants to start with news. Um, did you guys happen to see that Google streaming thing that came out? That was in the news. They um, brought out like uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey and they were showing how they can stream it, basically Google taking on all of the load. The idea is that with their streaming platform, it's not quite like streaming like with Twitch, you know, it's not streaming so people can like watch you play a game, but it's literally just streaming the game, kind of like NVIDIA, what was it, NVIDIA Go, I think, or NVIDIA Now, um, where you're able to basically um, stream the game from a different place. So Google is taking the processing. So you're not playing the game from a hard drive or a, a disc. You're actually stream playing it from Google. I see. So <clears throat> not having to need a $1,000 computer in order to play some of these more demanding games. That is their angle, I'm thinking. So yeah, thoughts? I, I think there are, there are a few companies who have been talking about like creating a service where you basically download your game onto like a cloud drive. Right. Right. And then you play it off of that drive. Um, I think it's an interesting idea. You're right. It definitely would create a situation where people wouldn't feel like they needed as much memory if they really just use their computer for gaming for the most part. Like you would probably be able to get like a smaller system, but whether or not, I, I mean, Programs that in the past have suffered from latency are starting to have less and less latency. Like they are getting better, but that would be my first worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, don't want to be the guy to poo poo this, but I'm going oh, to have to. Believe me, I, I kind of want to already, but I'm trying to provide I, like the landscape. So be my guest. <laughs> immediately, as always, with everything that has to do with something like this, my mind goes back to the days of what is cloud gaming and those ads we would mm. see all the time. And uh, the same thing that I thought then I think about now, even though it's probably better, but like input lag latency, like what, what, how's that going to work? There's a lot of factors that go into something like this. And a lot of it has to do with your IP. Right. And uh, there's, there's just a lot of different things that go into the ability to make this worth your time and for many people it, it's it seems like it wouldn't be i guess is, is my thoughts i, I, I was, I was going to say this is very much the end game for a lot of these big companies right which is to have a box that there would be no more consoles if you could get this working perfectly right that would be that would be it and there's only a few companies that could really do it in the space right i mean it's amazon it's google it's microsoft you have to have an incredible infrastructure to do this and so, you know, to me, you know, that, that, that's where these people all want to be. And as, as you said, there's certain kinds of products that uh, the input isn't as, uh, as important, right? If you're playing an adventure game, for example, you probably don't really have to worry about that issue. If I'm in a shooter and I got to send signals up and down the pipe where a, a fraction of a second, you know, means life and death, then that, that's a problem. So I think that'll be the biggest thing for them to solve. But you can bet there are billions of dollars being thrown at this, at this and that, that's where they really all want to end up being. Because, you know, if you think about it, like if you watch a movie on Netflix, it's just sh shoving frames down a pipe very fast. And so right. a, a game is just frames down a pipe. You know, the only difference is you got to get up the pipe right and back down to your point. And so, but, but, but just as a general thing, that wants to be the end goal for these companies. Sure. I, I know we saw a, a fair amount of it during E3. I think PlayStation doing their PlayStation Now, they were still you know, hammering it a little bit. Cloud gaming in general is just, I don't know, that term just, <clears throat> I don't know. Well, it's, 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 this, it's this summit or some sort of holy grail that they're trying to reach yeah. that they're not going to stop. It's going to be it, much like VR. It, everything's a cyclical thing where it's like, okay, we reached the limits of what we can do now, but we're coming back to it. Don't worry. And I feel like that's something that we're always going to see over and over and over again. And, um, I guess much like VR this time, it's starting to become more and more like, oh my god, uh, this could be, a f I, I could, I could live long enough to see my holodeck. That's what I want. That's where we're going. Me and Riker, Jonathan <laughs> Frake, hanging out together. That's my dream. Yeah. I finally got the uh, basement room finished painted, so now it is uh, green screen green, um, and so now Perfect. I have an entire room that's painted for green screen, um, just to make a VR holodeck. And then oh, yeah. the day I finished putting in all of the um, Oculus 
set up, the email came. And Oculus is like, new system coming out, like quarter one, 2019, no wires, no wires, no nothing. No. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> Again, I cannot stress this enough. Take, if you're in LA and, or New York or Chicago, take a moment, find the new- do the Star Wars experience. Do that Star Wars experience. <laughs> It literally is, they made a new, I guess the new, they announced they're doing a spinoff for home VR based off of that. Uh, but it's a Star Wars experience that straight up is like headset, vest, nothing else. You don't need gloves, you don't need cords, you don't need nothing. And you like see your hands in VR and you can touch stuff in VR. It is outstanding. And it is, it is so close to what I'm like, that's what we need at home. We need that stuff. If I don't have to have wires or I don't have to use controllers, it was so fun being the tiniest stormtrooper yeah. and looking around and being like, oh, it <laughs> knows how tall we all are. Like, it was really fun. <laughs> Is that the, it, said, um, it said you're going to have your rooms equipped to like blow hot air on you and cold <laughs> air, but orange scents and yeah. electric yeah. or whatever to kind of relive the experience that you're actually sort of seeing. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of like the, um, oh, what is that ride at Disney? The, um, the one where you fly? They, California they take Adventure. Yeah, it's over in California Adventure. Uh, it's that. It's the one where uh, you um, like skies over America. Or yeah, sky, yeah, like, yeah, 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 like yeah. Rise and so, the one where you just sit there and it like takes you up. Yeah, and then yeah, that way. Sunset at you as you fly over all the different places. It's can the I, most mom and dad ride I've ever been on. I, I love can it. I, <laughs> can I? Yeah. Can I admit something to you guys? That ride has always made me like tear up. Don't know why. At the end, it always makes me I have me no idea why. I always feel like I'm going to cry when I'm on that ride. It's, it's the daffodil <laughs> daydream that they <laughs> spritz onto you after. It's like, it's your, oh. it's your improv. It does it every time. Can yeah. I tell you what I think it is, too? It's the fact that they use the soundtrack to the movie Rudy in that ride constantly. <laughs> So it's this like emotional build up the entire you're time. You're lying like, and you're like, the earth is so incredible. <laughs> let that boy play that game. And by God, he got in the, oh my God. Yeah. Oh, I have that. <laughs> yeah. How did you know it was the theme from Rudy? How, uh, I, your, your trivia base is impressive. I am. I love that movie. It's one of, it's one of the few like sports movies. I'm like, yeah, Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like, I just know that. I know that song. Amazing. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, so Jesse, what are your thoughts on this latest development from CD Project Red? <laughs> Which is this? What is this development? Um, the original creator basically asking for more royalty money and uh CD Project Red basically saying there's no foundation for this, smacked it down and psh well, uh, I also read this morning they're denying that he asked for it. Right, right. It supposedly came uh, from his legal I, counsel, but I, yet they published a PDF of it. Right. Yeah, that, but I didn't get that part, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I I don't know. Like, if you, if you made a world, I mean, I guess he's probably just kicking himself in the butt, if it is legitimate. He's probably just kicking himself in the butt that he didn't hold on and hang out for more. He didn't believe in CD Projekt Red being able to make a good game and a world based off of you know, the initial franchise and idea. So. I don't, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the details in front of me. I did oh, not okay. hear about this, but my uh, okay. assumption would be that this is someone who was involved in like Witcher 1 and then pieced out after that <laughs> and then was like, all right, which dude did better, but like screw these guys. And then they're like, oh, Witcher 3, can I like get a piece of that? I, yeah. I don't, I honestly truly don't know, but that's like, what it sounds like, and I imagine they're like you weren't even involved in Witcher Three, dude. Get out of here. Yeah, the demand uh, was for sixteen million dollars <laughs> in additional yeah. royalties. I That's don't. Like, I mean, cool. good luck. <laughs> I don't. I don't know the rules, especially in Poland, when it comes to legal stuff like this. So I have no clue if there's any basis for it, but. If that I, is what's going on, that's like super slippery slope, right? Like, yeah. oh well, I was involved in the creation of the first one. So without me, the first one wouldn't exist, which would mean the second one wouldn't exist, which would mean the third one wouldn't exist. So obviously I deserve money for helping out with the first one. It's like, oh, is this the, are we talking about the author? Yes. Yeah, oh. mm -hmm. the author. Yeah. Oh, Sipkowski. the author of like yeah. the author. Witcher series. Right, right. right. Oh, oh, that's all right. Well, I do know about this and the fact that like he hated what they did with the witcher franchise mm -hmm. i know that for a fact like he was not a fan the entire time so the fact that now he's like but hey about some of that money <laughs> it's like dude you 
talk shit on them the entire time, and now you want money? Um, I mean, yeah. I, again, I don't know if there's any legal basis, but I think like on a like a keep it cool level, it's kind of a dick move. But you know, legally, who knows? He might have something where he can go in and be like, "I made like Geralt is my creation, right? I let it- you use it." So, who knows? Isn't he probably making a shitload of money from the Netflix series as well? Never who knows? Know. That's the yeah, whole thing. You don't, know, you don't know how the deal was done on the Netflix series to be based upon the games instead of the the books, which right. would like, change the dynamics of the deal. You never I know. So. Yeah, I don't... Uh, yeah, but that every every previous story <clears throat> about him has basically been like, he's pretty salty all the time about stuff. Like, yeah. he... Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't really know uh, what legally that can do. Like, I don't know what paperwork they sign. Like, if they said, because Lord knows you can create a character, but if you sign that thing away and they paid you a certain amount, then you have no rights to be like, uh, can I have more money now that you made a ton off of that? Like, no, you <laughs> sold it to us for $150,000 and now we own your character at the end. So I, don't know. Know, <clears throat> I don't know how true this is. But in chat, people are saying that um, he sold the rights to yeah. CD Projekt Red, mm-hmm. so that means that, yeah, the Netflix series probably went through CD Projekt Red. Most likely. And also that I guess he's been recorded as saying that he believes that the games are the reason that more people don't buy the books. So he's, like, <laughs> mad that people are playing the games instead of reading the books or something. <laughs> and, um, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, the like, books are loosely based... The games are loosely based off the books right. for the most part. So, especially Witcher 2. Like, if you play that one, it has no bearing on book reality. Like, yeah, I don't know. I Good luck to him, I guess. You know, we'll you know Walt Disney had a character, and I, the name escapes me early on in his career, and he had sold the rights off to somebody, and he couldn't get them back, and he was so upset about it. That's why he... That's where Mickey the Mouse and Disney came from. He said, I'm not going to lose the rights to my character again and that's what drove yep. the drove it to today yeah it, i think it's one of those things that if you go back oh my god uh 1999 when the first witcher game came out or 2000 something whenever that was god that was a long time ago i can't remember what year it was 2001 maybe whenever that came out you can imagine him being like hundred thousand bucks or however much he made who knows oh, this yeah. is a random number i'm making up but like they paid him a certain amount of money for it at the time like awesome great the first game didn't do that great. Not many people played it. Um, it was very bizarre and what it was. But, like, you know, I feel like at the time he thought he made out like a bandit. And then cut to 15 years later or whatever, he's like, uh, I want my due. <laughs> Which one was 2007? God, that is a – from 1999 to 2010, God, I'm letting you know, that is a blur. That is all – it's all blurred together. So there you go. Yep. And almost everything else news-wise, I just haven't even really been paying much attention to. Those were like the big things that jumped out at me, and I was just like, yeah, I might, just, might as well discuss some of those. Um, but I figured since we talked so much about news last week that maybe we'd talk a little bit more on games this week, just trying to keep it fresh and change it up a little bit. Last week was obviously really heavy for us because of uh, the Telltale situation and wanting to cover that and give those people a platform to hopefully go on to bigger and better things sure <laughs> fingers crossed <laughs> um so what have you guys been playing this week uh do you Are want to talk about it talk about? You're, you're muted because <laughs> she's before we start- <laughs> sorry before we started the show i got yelled at a lot in my time on this show for eating so i always mute myself i don't um, yell at you for it that's true i, know. I wouldn't do that you called me a cashew chicken eating motherfucker. <laughs> People still say that in my chat sometimes. <laughs> Can you just get a ago. shirt that would, says no, that? Never. Just <laughs> like go to a convention and just have a shirt that says that. It's like I and, never. and, and, and now you've reminded them all. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And now and now it's just oof. Yeah, now here you go. Yeah. <laughs> um before uh, we started the show. Jesse was talking about his experience with the new Cube Escape game. Oh, I don't okay. know, if, Jesse. I don't know if you wanted to talk about your feels on that since you hadn't played it last. Yeah. Time. Um. Did you talk about it last week? Yeah, we talked about okay. it last week for quite a while. 
No. Uh, <laughs> it's all right if you just checked out of that. Is, yeah. I would not. I would be if you had to ask a person like what happened last week. I would not be the person to ask. I um, yeah. Cube Escape is a game that boy. How do you even describe it? Uh, Cube Escape is a branch off from the Rusty Lake series. Uh, Rusty well, the Lake Escape games were first, right? right I right. believe so. Yeah. And I feel like I feel like the way you could describe it is Cube Escape were a bunch of weird games that were somewhat connected. Then Rusty Lake came along and was like, "We're making a universe based around these games," and now it's all connected in some sort of weird way. It's one of those things where when you beat a game, you don't necessarily get an ending. You get like a "see you in the next game" kind of thing, mm. or something that ties like a little tiny hint that ties into a previous game, or uh, in the case of this game, a secret that you can unlock in the game that gives you more stuff. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> after the previous Rusty Lake games, they released a new Cube Escape game, and the, it's Cube Escape Paradox. And it is a game that takes place, um, I'm going to say before Rusty Lake Hotel, which is a very bizarre I think bizarre right game. before Hotel, I think, yeah. yeah. Very bizarre, very weird games. Uh, they're all always free or very, very cheap, and they are games that are... Um, Looks like something you'd see on Newgrounds a few years ago, but they're always like very bizarre and fun and weird. Um, and this one, you play a detective who wakes up in a room and you clearly were trying to solve a murder or were involved in a murder case. And uh, the previous characters from the other games, like Mr. Crow, who is just like a man with a crow head, and like all these other weird characters show up and... You are trying to uh, escape the room, essentially. And it's very bizarre uh, to the point of, like, like, at one point you're just, like, taking your brain out and putting other brains in in order to, like, see through stuff. Uh, you're going through TV channels. And this time they, they mix real-life things with the video game. Yeah, I think that's the first time they've done that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I'm actually thinking of a different game that did it. Um actually on ios that one game where you have to like move your ipad like around and stuff to continue on with it is like red and it was all very flat it's also very cold ah. war-esque i'm trying to think of what game it is but it wasn't that one so yeah you guys are right it's the first time that they've done that but it was a different game that i'm thinking of entirely yeah, I played yeah, games. It's, it's, what they did is they released the game in two parts there's part one part two and then a movie it's like 20 minutes long 18 minutes mm -hmm. something like that and it is a very scary well done film and it is essentially, if you play chapter one, it is literally the cinematic retelling chapter of chapter one. one. Yeah. But there are weird things added to it that you're like, oh, I wonder what this is for. And oh, is to, that a clue? Yeah. And so in eventually what you end up doing is when you go to chapter two, or, and in chapter one to some extent, you're literally going back through and being like, watching the movie almost frame by frame because there's things hidden in it or little messages hidden in it or one of the achievements later on is, is identifying how many things of certain types were in like how many classes were in this scene in the movie and that helps you solve a, a riddle or thing it's right it's an interesting unique way of of trying to like hide weird shit in their other games by introducing you to this movie that's also very bizarre and weird so mm. yeah um, it, was, it was neat <clears throat> i finally went and started playing the like short iOS cube escape games. Sure. Oh, okay. And okay. I think the one that easily goes right before Paradox is the mill. The so one before you me to play Paradox? That. Oh, okay. Uh, I was gonna yeah, say so if you played Paradox and you go yeah. and go and play the mill, all of the ones on the phone are literally like 20 minute games. Like they're yeah. very, very short. But um yeah, I thought that that one felt the most like it came right before um the Paradox. cave is supposed to have sort of um like the, the time is technically unknown they don't actually mm -hmm. publish what time it's in but i think you're probably right because the mill setting is actually in 1972 mm. and the cave also was set in 1972 and then theater was set in 1971 and birthday which came right before that was actually set in 1939 because that's um the that's first when he's young yes yeah yeah and that's like the first time i think that you are del vandermeer actually possibly mm -hmm. in the series well you if, know, you want, if you want to get, you you get the weird too. vibe of like what the hell this game oh, is yeah. just go play rusty lake hotel rusty yeah, lake hotel a is, is a game that 
it has stuff to do with everything else that's going on, but like the initial premise is like you are going to a to a hotel and you everyone there is like an anthropomorphic animal person and you need to serve them dinner every night. And the way you serve them dinner is by going to a room, solving a bunch of puzzles, and murdering one of the guests, and then serving like the pheasant woman or the boar man to all the other guests. And you have to do that every single night. And then at the end, some weird shit happens and you're like, what was that about? And then you're just like on the roller coaster of this franchise. Yeah. Cause hotel was the first one, at least for Jesse and I, that was the first one that we played. Yeah. And it like, it's for both of us. We were like, we need to play more. Like where are more of these games? What the fuck? Yeah, it's, <laughs> I was it's wondering definitely if that might actually bizarre. It might have actually been their first release on Steam, maybe, and I wonder if maybe that's why it was the first that was such a big game. deal. Yeah. yeah, I played them all on iOS, and I, I I love them. It's it is weird. It's like if you enjoy watching movies like Mother, you might enjoy this game series because it's very macabre and very out there. And I, I don't know, I, I liked it very much. Dodger mentioned last week the fact that it's all just like one dude's voice, men, women, who whatever yeah. characters. It's all just that one, Great. and it has again the vibe and feel of an old Newgrounds game. So it even has like the shitty microphone quality where it's just like, <laughs> it would be weird if suddenly it didn't have that. Exactly. If it didn't have the weird, and, and that's even in the video, in the movie they made, they still had the shitty microphone quality when the guy called on the phone. I was like, of course they would. Cause that's what I come to expect now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's weird that that's acceptable. Then it was like, of course, it has he has to sound terrible. And all the female characters just have to sound like him in a little higher voice. Of course. Of course, that's exactly what this game needs. And I don't know why. I guess because you just come to accept it after so many games. Like, that's what you expect in the franchise. Any other game, I'd be like, this is garbage. What? <laughs> Who made this? For some reason, you make it weird, and it makes sense. I also like the fact that his name is Dale Vandermeer, and Vandermeer means from the lake. In Dutch. Does it really? Yeah. Amazing. So what does like Vanderboom every... mean? <laughs> yeah, what does Vanderboom mean? Yeah, I want to know that too. Yeah. What is Vanderboom? Google is your friend, Jesse. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if you do the super secret ending to this one, you get entered into a contest. And I'm hoping they're giving you props from the movie because some of the shit in that movie, I, I want that weird ass painting of the crow man talking to like the dude who's like, oh, I want that behind me, just like there. And people can be weirded out by like, what the hell is that? And I'm like, I don't know. It's a gift from Vanderboom means from the tree. <laughs> there you go. So there you go. Anyway, continue. That was the Wonder Man story. <laughs> <laughs> So Brian, yeah. do you do you play things that are that are in this vein? Like you know, I mean, I know puzzle games. You know, that's that's a bit more Bard's Tale, but you know, in 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 general, do you play crazy little things like this? Well, I I hate to miss out on a good cannibal game. I mean, geez, I mean that's <laughs> it <laughs> that's is al that's always a great subject, you know. Uh, it is very strange, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes I stumble upon weird games that I'll that I'll quite enjoy. I mean. Uh, n n nothing is popping to mind like what you guys are talking about. Mo <laughs> more on the seems like on the movie side, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do I do actually like a lot of bizarre puzzle games. They do. Uh, I love the room. I love Cover Orange, which Cover a lot of people don't know on iOS, which was great. Little little games like that. That uh, especially when I'm on planes and I'm traveling. But uh, I haven't played anything recently like what you guys are describing. I, I don't think there are many games kind of close to what we're describing. No, yeah, yeah, maybe ever, right? <laughs> This game is kind of like the Devolver <laughs> Conference of E3. <laughs> it's just like, it's like what? Yeah, what did I, what did I just want? Bizarre, watch? but you right. want more. <laughs> sounds like, like you said, it sounds like Mother. Yes, yeah, yeah it, it very much does. <laughs> it comes down to like this basic human need to just understand what the hell you just spent an hour doing. Yeah. That's pretty much what this game is. And every other game in the franchise is just like, <sighs> what just happened? Like, why did I do that? You and then it's like, oh, well, you can find out by playing this game. You're like, all right. Screw and then it. no. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't explain anything. Nothing is it, explained. Well, the thing is, it gives you more information. It's, it's, it's like, I'm terrified that it's going to end up like Lost, but it feels like Lost, where <laughs> they give you more information. You're like, oh, I know what this means and what this means and what this means, but I right. still have no idea what yeah. X, Y, or Z from previous. I, I, I watch some TV shows or some series where 
you know, it, they'll start off with, you know, whatever the plot is, and they'll slowly, it'll all come together at the end and wrap up in a bow. And there's other shows I watch, which get more and more and more complicated, and they get to the end, I'm more confused when the darn thing ends than when it started. Mm -hmm. I, and you're like, still to this day, don't know what the hell the Cylons plan was. What were their plans? <laughs> Several seasons was like, and they have a plan. I don't know what the hell their plan was. I still don't know. I think I read the writer said they didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> what was what was their plan? Yeah, I have no clue. But how to write I, a hit TV show? <laughs> don't, don't have that, a plan. I'll still, in it. I'll still be in it because I believe maybe there's a chance that I'll get my answer. Even if the episode ends, you're like, don't you get it? It's Earth. You're like. <laughs> okay, I didn't get what I wanted, but I'm fine. I'm fine. Don't you but like, I didn't get what I wanted. Jessup? No. <clears throat> so, Brian, have you been playing any specific games lately? I've been working my tail off lately. That's what I've been doing. No, making yeah. games? What? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ready for Red Dead. I mean, I'm definitely going to play that. I mean, you know, oh, any yeah. game that simulates horse testicles, you know, you got to sign up for that, right? <laughs> So uh, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, to the storytelling that they do in that. But no, I mean, other than I, I play a little Hearthstone with my friends, and and you know, but that, but nothing, nothing new lately. Like, yeah, when you're filing a product, boy, it's all encompassing. So it's it's been it's been quite a run here for the past past month. Yeah, would you like to tell our audience kind of what you've been working on, what has been released? Yeah, we we just released uh, Bard's Tale Four. I think it was on the 18th, so just a couple of weeks ago. And that was our third Kickstarter, which so I'm happy to uh, say, you know, sort of give crowdfunding a good name. We've taken, we, we finished our third product. And uh, and we delivered a much bigger game than we had uh, sort of uh, led people on. I think we caught them by surprise, uh, especially the press, too. They, you know, they, they thought they were going to get a sort of a 25-hour game and it'd be like a 50- or 60-hour game. Oh, nice. And so, uh, yeah. And, I'm you know, I think the, uh, the writers and the music and, you know, they did really, he did a good job of it. We talked earlier about, you know, the world building of it all and trying to, and creatively, it was a very different product, right? I mean, like the oh, combat. Yeah. Um, it was like people go, well, it's, it's a little bit like Darkest Dungeon and it's a little bit like Hearthstone and it's a little bit like that. But, you know, we wanted to creatively try a completely different kind of combat system. And mm, so that, that's very much what we did. So we definitely, definitely took very different. creative <laughs> risk. Yeah. How, can I ask a question? So how do you end up... Um, most of the time you see a Kickstarter that's like, it's going to be an all encompassing open world, 65 hour game. And, <laughs> and they hype it up crazily. How do you end up with the reverse of that by saying, we're going to make this game. And then you end up with like right. another 40 hours tacked onto it. How does that mm -hmm. process happen? Well, you know, there's this funny friction, you know, when you do crowdfunding, because on one hand, you want to excite people enough that they want to back you early on. Cause it's a mm -hmm. tall ask, right? Which is to say, trust us, we're going to, we're going to deliver something. On the other hand, if you overhype something, whatever you deliver will be a disappointment, right? Sure, right. So, so you have to sort of find that, that happy spot. So for us, we try our best to underpromise and overdeliver, right, in any way we can, you know? And, and I think that certainly I believe visually we did this one and hours wise we did too. And I think Wasteland 2, most people felt that we underpromised and overdelivered on that. And that, that, that's a big part of it. But, but it is, it's, it's a magic sort of a niche between those two worlds. Mm -hmm. how, how do you, uh, how do you then under, like how do you under promise, but still keep <laughs> it being something that people w want? Cause right. You can, there's the risk that you can say like, you're not going to get X, Y, and Z, or we aren't going to do this. And people are going to be pissed off about that versus like, when you, it's like a fine line, right? That you have to walk doing that. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, look at when you crowdfund games, it, it creates different dynamics you would have otherwise. And we're just sort of, you're just sort of sitting back in your hole and then here it is and everybody's surprised. Right. So like you said, the, the value, like there could be some little thing that, that sounded like it would be good early on in the campaign. You're like, it's probably not worth it. But on the other hand, if you don't put it in, now you're taking something away from somebody and they right. really don't like that. Right. Even though you could say, but we did these 1000 other things Right. No, you don't, that that one you didn't do. Right. So, so there's kind of the totality versus the specific. So it just creates different dynamics is all I'm saying. And, and so, um, sure. you know, we, we try to keep, keep keenly aware of all that. I feel like it, it probably also helps, like, at least for me as a person who loved like the earlier Bard's Tale games, um, I feel like if I saw 
like seeing a Kickstarter and being like, oh, Bard's Tale, right? <laughs> like that already like starts me off at a certain level of excitement. Sure. So, Do you find that that, that makes, uh, going off of what Dodger said, that gives people the sort of, it, it reminds me kind of, of when they did Mighty Number no. 9 and everyone was like, oh, Make a new Mega Man? Okay, yes, of course we're going <laughs> to kickstart that. Does having the franchise and having the, the title Bard's Tale give people sort of like, this is the game I'm buying into, so this is what I want? Is that the kind of vibe that you got? Or were they sort of just like, make something fun and new? Um, well, I, th I think when you, you use an existing franchise, especially one that's older, that it, it cuts both ways. Right on one hand, there, there, there's, a, there's a callback to the emotional time of when you played those original games, some of which is impossible to replicate. You know, people played these games when they were young. They had a lot of free time on their hands. And I remember people said, oh, I, I played Fallout. I learned how to speak English, you know, like that. Oh. So we can't ever replicate those things. So there's an emotional component we can't. And, of course, there's a long time span between the last ones. So you can't do a product that looks like it came out in the 90s. Right. So, so what we try to do is capture the feeling and sensibilities of that. Right. Which is like, OK, we know people want to walk around first person in a dungeon. Right. And feel immersed like that's that's a big part of it. Right. And we don't want to be up in the quarter of the window. We want full screen. So that, that was part of it. And we also you know what? We want to make sure it's tactically based combat. We don't want to have you just running backwards the whole time throwing rocks or we also don't want text scrolling by. So how do we bridge the gap? between those two worlds of a tactical combat that doesn't feel like it came out in the mid nineties, you know? So, so we try to focus on what we believe are the, again, the important aspects of what those made those games fun, which was, you know, right. wandering around, uh, you know, feeling lost at times, uh, you know, solving puzzles, you know, that sort of thing. And, 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 and managing a party of people versus one person. I think sure. this game does a very good job of bridging the gap. I mean, you're looking at, it, just to kind of piggyback on what, about what Jesse was asking in regards to crowdfunding, these are the people who played Bard's Tale back when who now have disposable income. It's my generation, basically. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, I feel like this game was made for people like me. And, and that's not, I don't think that's easy. Really? Because I'm kind of picky. <laughs> I like my single player games, <laughs> but I also like the idea of controlling a team of adventurers and, you know, going out into the world. And so far, I've been having a lot of fun with it. Um, and I think the combat is probably the thing that will keep me coming back to it because it's actually challenging, but it, it doesn't feel like you're getting, I don't know, like a big wall thrown up in front of you right away. But it, it does have challenges to it. It is very tactical. You do have to, I remember when I first discovered, it's like, oh, okay, wait, um, my practitioner can levitate. Oh, well, this just changes the entire game. It's like, because you can only use abilities that are, um, it's positional. So you can use certain abilities, certain characters, um, based upon where they are in your grid when you come up at combat. And initially I was just like, oh, great. I, I love this. I love the idea of this. Put them on the grid. Um, but it eventually got really difficult. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to like walk away and figure some stuff out and come back to it. And I, I like how satisfying games can be um, when, when they take that approach instead of just like, you know, giving me a cakewalk and then throwing some puzzles in here on the side to accommodate for a lack of combat. There's no lack of combat in this game. It's so much bigger than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> It's deceptively simple in the beginning, too, because at yes. first when you create your character, you go, hey, there's not that many variables, right? You know, but then as you start layering in and you start getting three, four and five characters, it gets really complex. And we watch some people play the game like you, you said you're having some difficult parts with combat. We've seen other streamers where they're playing it and they figured out some combo and they're just blazing through the game. <laughs> wow. Hardly ever dying. We're like, OK, well, that's really clever the way they figured about that out. So it is deceptively right. simple. I, and I think the other thing we wanted to do was to make sure that when you went up levels and you got more skills and you unlock things, that you could feel them. Right, that it was like, okay, and now I can affect something by 1%. We didn't want to give you a thousand variables that move Ooh. things by 1%, but you know, a hundred that can move them by 10%, right? You know, right. To, mm -hmm. basically. So, so we wanted you to, you could look at your upgrade path and go, ah, that's going to be great when I get that. I, I can understand how that's going to be important and how that's going to completely change the dynamic of combat when I get that next thing. So we, that was sort of a goal of ours. 
I like how lighthearted it is as well. It's like it is a dungeon crawler. Um, so you do have some grim settings in there. Well, you have but to have it light. I think it's Bard's Tale. It's Bard's Tale. Have have it yeah, like, yeah. It has to be lighthearted. And, and that's the thing. It's like some people might give it a bit of flack on some of the graphics because they, they think they've been somehow thought to expect, you know, AAA graphics in every game because every system can handle it, of course. And it's not easy to develop a game that actually looks incredibly pretty at the same time sounds amazing and is totally immersive but the sound in this game is the phenomenal thing the vo like fully acted out is just incredible the songs and of course songs are a big part of bard's tale in general but especially in this game i feel like it was more immersive than some games which have had better graphics but that's maybe that's just down to me as a player maybe that's just down to me loving the franchise i'm not sure but uh, for me the well, sound think... really makes it having uh, adversaries who are like calling for help and stuff like little details like that really yeah. made a difference i think you could debate all sorts of aspects of the game but the, but the music is triple a quality yes i mean i think that that, that for sure i'll i'll defend that to the you know to my <laughs> dying day right i mean that that it really it really is and when i was watching the streamers play it because I just watch the comments, right? Because it's very oh, yeah. raw, right? Like, you don't, they're not going to type in anything. They don't care what you hear, right? And right. so I get to see what they, what they like, what they don't like, and but the music constantly and a lot of Witcher references, Witcher 3 references <laughs> too, and, and, and listening to the music. It, it really, you know, over, you know, I don't know, 100 different pieces of music, over 350 speaking parts. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a big product and it's, it's very bold. But yeah, sounds a very fun. I did read one review. A guy cracked me. He says, "Wow, my only problem was uh, the accents. They they weren't uh, accurate." I went, "They're all recorded in Scotland. Every single." <laughs> <laughs> this is not accurate. <laughs> what else do I Amazing. do? <laughs> Go find Scots who aren't Scots and just yeah, do it. I know. Anyway, that 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 made How us weird. laugh and cringe at the same time. That's crazy. <laughs> I like the puzzles huh. too. Like the puzzles weren't. Um, overly difficult i guess but they're entertaining they actually well, they, they, meant they something <laughs> yeah, I'm, and i'm sure they do i'm not i'm not finished with it yet by any stretch because yeah. i was expecting like you know 20 hours and i'm here i'm like okay how far am i in and i, I like googled and it's like 40 plus hours i'm like oh i'm not even like halfway <laughs> um yeah, you know one of the things we did that not everybody has picked up on is that we wanted to put some really complex puzzles in but mm -hmm. There are some people that they're not puzzle people, right? And and, and what we didn't want to do was um, create a hard stop, right? I'm playing the game, I'm at the puzzle, and I just can't move forward. So we right. put a strategy guide for free to everybody. So all the all the answers are in the strategy guide. So you can always oh, just that's cool. flip and go and look at it, right? Because we didn't want if you're a puzzle person, have at it, rack your brain, think about it. But if you just want to go buy it, then then you can. We didn't want you to get stuck. That's an interesting way to do it. Yeah. To be like, we're, we're going to make the game that we want to make, but if there's a part of the game that is just not your thing and you still want to experience it, here's a walkthrough. Please don't be ashamed to use it. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, you know, we, we want you to do what game. you like to do, right? Whatever, whatever aspects of the game you enjoy the most, we want you to spend the most time doing that. Mm. I was really pleased uh, when I saw a patch come out not too stu not too late after release to address some of the other issues that I was suffering from. I did have some, well, well I say some, it was actually a lot of frame drops, difficulty maintaining 60 FPS. Um, not only did the patch fix those issues, which I was grateful for, but they added in an FOV slider on the day of the patch <laughs> in the options menu. Perfect. <laughs> I know, it's like, nailed it. <laughs> yeah, th there were some things like that that we, well, there was two parts of it. We, we did have a rough start on the launch day. There's no, no question that we, we own that. I think it's important to know that we actually use a compatibility company, right, to help us with this stuff. And... Um, they're like thumbs up. In fact, lower your min specs. And so, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, so that was a bit of a surprise. So you know, uh, so it was disappointing for us because people were. I mean, I guess the good news is they wanted to play. They were excited yes. to play, mm. and, and they were having issues or frame rate or whatever. So we, I mean, we've still been. I mean, we've been working our butts off. You know, seven days a week. We've already got two patches out, and we got a third one coming. But there were things like people who had twenty one nine monitors, right? We didn't oh. support that. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. I mean, that was like whole threads. You know, you'd think we'd put microtransactions in the game. 
You know, I mean, it was nuts. Loot so, boxes? So. What? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so, but that's fine. I mean, that's the name of the game. And so we're, you know, we're scrambling and, and, uh, and there's a lot of, you know, sometimes people, they, 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 they're at the min spec, so they put it on ultra settings and we're like, well, hey, you can't put those two together. That's going to be a problem. So there's some education that's required. Um, so anyway, so yeah, it was, it was, it was a rough first day, but we're, uh, we're, uh, we, we have definitely improved a lot of those issues. Awesome. I think it's really fun so far. If, if, uh, you enjoy looking at Dobby, the house elf on steroids, play trial. Great. Great. (laughs) Just do it. it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so yeah, Bard's Tale. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of. Yo, if you want another Bard related, uh, easy segue game. Ooh. Let me give a shout out to uh, Wonder Song, which is a game where you play. As, it's a side scrolling oh, game. That song is great. It, it's 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 like a lovely little adventure game where you play as a bard and you solve all of your problems with the power of music. And oh. and uh, the radial on your controller is all the different notes, and you sort of just sing songs to defeat enemies. And it is it is very simple and very lovely and very cute. And uh, it, it's. For a game about the end of the world, it's 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 a joy. It's a real joy, like a real sweet sweet game. Yeah, I totally agree. I uh, picked that up. What is it on Switch? And mm-hmm. I played not too long of it because I was playing a lot of other things this week. Um, I just I thought it was really adorable. Um, oh, this looks so cute. Yes, yeah. it, it is very cute. I I do like just the uh, the entire aesthetic the thought of the game in general i was just like this is a game about what <laughs> you know yeah. for, for me we, we just we really we, i love the dungeon crawl genre you know and to me there hasn't been any big efforts on that so our hopes is to to bring it back because i personally find it very satisfying but perhaps i'm i'm too old and nobody you know who knows you know you know who else wants that experience but for for me i mean i have to i play my games also, right? I have to play them and and sort of react. How am I feeling or reacting to things? And my guys don't, you know, I sort of, the way I manage these projects is I, I set the sensibilities of them. Like these are the important things and let's stick to them, you know, and remind people and don't let them wander off course, even though we have a short set of things. But they'll be, once we get in the, in the rhythm, you know, they'll start to create things. I don't know everything they're going to put in, right? But, but we're, we're hitting the right things. So I am able to experience it as, as a player. And, you know, I found myself staying up late at night, actually playing my own game, you know, go one more <laughs> level, one more combat. Let me just get through this one thing. And so I, I genuinely had a good time playing the game, you know, and I thought, God, I just, I really, I missed this. Right. Which is cause I don't, I'm not really, I don't like, like I'm not a dark souls guy. Right. You know, uh, my guys love it, but it, it's, it's a little, it's that's not my personal thing. Like there's not a lot of games where I get to, walk around and, and, and stop and think and you know almost like have like a mini hearthstone match basically and then move on right and then explore those things so i just like that kind of product mm. well I, like dungeon crawlers in general i feel like are a it's a phenomenal genre of games that like i think it gets lost in the woods sometimes of what you're looking for, like what people are looking for in a dungeon crawler right there's like a core set of things that people are like this is what I want. This is going to keep me moving forward, keep me looking and exploring, and keep me sort of guessing what's around every corner. And right. there has to, like, you have to walk that fine line. And I think in a lot of cases, people get lost up in, like, things like difficulty and things <laughs> like like loot discovery, even though that's a part of it. It's like, oh, yeah, no, there's, like, you can get the sort of everlasting life, but also there's a plus one version of that somewhere. It's like, okay. Sure, I guess we're hunting this now. So there's like a lot of stuff that that can go into a dungeon crawler that it can almost be too much and too overbearing. And there's like a fine line of like, no, it you can keep it simple, but still give you all the feels of like experiencing the crawl. Right, right. And then and then there's also that you know the people they like you know the, the role playing games become more open world in nature, right? Which is you know I can go for miles and miles. Uh, the, the, the amount of content between now and then might not be a lot, but at least I felt like I really covered a lot of ground and sure. got there where, where the, the dungeon crawls are more linear in nature, right? Like we, it's not an open world game. It feels like one at times, right? But mm-hmm. when, I wouldn't claim that it is, but there, there, there's kind of a difference in the sense of 
cause and effect you can do in an open world, which is different than a dungeon crawl uh, and, and, and when it's sort of a puzzle solving uh, combat, you know, party combat oriented experience. Yeah, right. for me, for me with dungeon crawling games, uh, an aspect that I always really appreciate is like you're just dropped in and you don't know where you're supposed to go. <laughs> um, like, like I really enjoy that, and I know a lot of people where when I say that they're like, "No, I hate that." <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but I, I do like, I like con- the contained exploration aspect. Right well, when I'm when I'm playing a game that's like an actual open world, I feel kind of overwhelmed. When I'm playing a dungeon crawler that's that's like a crafted dungeon crawler, um, I really enjoy it because I'm like, there are there are limitations here. I can explore all of it. And so like that's that's enjoyable for me. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that we talk about on this podcast often is the fact that like the more open world games that exist, the less excited I am to play them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. like, I I really don't want to explore all of your. I know that a lot of time and energy went into this world, but the it, there's only so much stuff to do, and most of it's walking around and like looking at things that I I want the adventure. I can go look at trees outside. Like I don't I don't need this. And so there's definitely something special about finding a game that is it, it, the way people describe it. Like it's linear. It's very contained. Like. For some reason, that seems bad, but it's not. Like, I love the idea that I can just start a thing and go on an adventure and and have a story, and it isn't like me just being lost, wandering around a world that looks great, but has nothing in it. I'd rather be lost at the same time threatened by shit. Like, in a dungeon <laughs> crawler, I'm lost, but stuff's actually trying to kill me the entire time, so you feel a little more panicked about the situation, which is fun for the experience. Yeah, well, and, yeah. And, and part of it also is we have to make sure that you're seeing new content constantly. Right, as part of it, right. So you're not you're not wandering. You're always like every every hour you're seeing new kinds of mechanics or new kind of monsters, new kind of things, and so that with that tighter experience, we can also make sure that 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 gets served up well. Right. right. Yeah. I um. This is just kind of naturally what I'm thinking of because I've finally gone back to do all the DLC in it. But um, I thought Hollow Knight did all of that so well. Yes. Yes. Like like every. Every time you finally found a new area and like kind of got your bearings a little bit, it was shaken up again because you were in a, <laughs> a a place that looked totally different. Um, but you knew like, but literally right over there, there were like jellyfish and shit, right? And if I go up, then there's <laughs> like, it's it's just, it felt, everything felt so new. And every time you got to experience a new thing, you were like excited because it was so vibrantly different. Um, and at the same time, you knew like, this doesn't go on forever, right? Like I can, I can find all of the different areas and I want to, because they're all such a breath of fresh air every time. Um, I, I think that that sort of an idea was so well done in Hollow Knight. To me, to me, if you have, if you have a good game, you know, you want to like go through and then as you're towards the end of the game, you almost look back at it like. I feel like I just watched the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. You know, like, <laughs> I, I feel like I've been in this world forever, you know, so and then cool. when it ends, you're kind of sad. Yeah. You know, because you're actually, you're leaving the world. To me, I think mission accomplished when you can make people a little sad at the end. You need those three endings. You don't want it to end <laughs> once or twice. You need the third one too. Just like fade to black again and let's start it back up. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. You don't yeah. want to yeah, yeah. That, to me, that's the that's like sometimes I read books that are very long. I read you know thousand page books, and 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 people are like, oh, my, how do you do it? I said, if you have a good book, you don't want it to end. I mean, you're bummed out. You're like, now what am I going to do with my life? I really enjoyed that. So if if you're nailing it, you you want the experience to just keep going. I have that oh problem God. with a lot of RPGs where I will start an RPG, get 98% through and just not finish it. I was just I've going to say Yes. That. Yeah. I am because a I'm serial like, offender. I don't ever want it to end. And I just like, I don't know how that game ended. Everyone was fine. It's okay. Yeah. I, I did know. that with uh, Persona 5 for a long time. Like I got to the very end of Persona 5 and then I dropped it for a while because I was like, <laughs> I just don't want to. It just like didn't. Just, like, you I know, it's winding down. For a long time. <laughs> I don't oh, know the Persona end. Persona Five did a great job of, of, of that, of, of, <laughs> of party-based combat exploration. I give them a lot of credit for the way they handled it. Really yeah. well done. It kind of got that way over um, 
uh, torment, literally, just because of the environment. Because I was so caught off guard by the environment. I don't know why. I was just like, oh, this is all like more science fiction-y stuff than, than what I thought it was going to be. I don't know why I thought it would be any different than it was. It, but you just got used to things being a certain way in the aesthetic. And not a lot of games were doing that at the time. And I was just like, I don't want to finish it. <laughs> Well, we, we for, for better or for worse, we do like to experiment here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, I was the same way at Interplay, you know. I mean, we, we try. I mean, Planescape Torment was a big experiment. I mean, that was that that was, I agree. Lit that that was unlike anything else. Or or Giants, if people remember that game, or or MDK. Uh, you know, we did a lot of very strange things back then that we, you know, sort of artistically wanted to try something new and different. Uh, Always risky, <laughs> but but we uh, <laughs> but we but we definitely like to mix it up a little bit. I mean, something like Wasteland Three, for example, is less risky in nature, right? Uh, because yeah, because you guys are deciding to throw in multiplayer into that. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> but 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 fundamentally, you know exactly what you're getting with Wasteland Three, right? Because I mean, it, people love the Wasteland Two experience. We're like, okay, we know they love that. Let's upgrade the visuals. Let's give them more to do tactically. Let's get even better at storytelling. And then, of course, yeah, the multiplayer aspect, which you mentioned. Yeah, I, I was kind of surprised by that last one. I don't I don't know why that shocked me. It just it just felt weird. I was just like, I was like, nuanced story. We're taking the story, you know, dynamics from, from Torment. And we're literally putting them in Wasteland. I'm just like, yes, these are all the things I want. And then multiplayer. Yeah, multiplayer. well, then maybe I should explain that. Yeah, so... Here's the first thing. The writers were, are cre crafting the game in a way independent of it being multiplayer. Because uh -huh. the writers are like, there's no fucking way this is going to be anything less but an unbelievable single-player narrative game. The question is, can we make it a little more fun for you to experience with your friend without changing the dynamic of what that single-player experience is? So, for example, with us, it's not really set up multiplayer for strangers. It's really your, it's for you and your friend to play and go through the world together. And so, you, and you're not, you know, you can grief the other player, but you know, it's not all about trying to <laughs> kill your friend or whatever. It, it's really about experience together. But you can play it, right? And then you can decide, you know what? Um, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna log off for the night. Uh, it, it, and you say, okay, I will too. And then you don't then really, you don't. and you keep going, <laughs> right? And you, and you can actually change the world. So when, so when I get back in, I'm like, hey, what, you know, why, why? Why are all the animals following me around or whatever, you know, whatever thing I've done or you've done to me that, that, that's changed the world, which is kind of fun. But I have the uh, the option to say, you know what, you changed the world so much. I don't know what you did. I'm actually going to branch off. And then you can then I could then branch off to, and from my own narrative and go straight from there. So that's so that, that, that was different. the kind of the thing we wanted to play with without losing any part of the single player narrative that we know is so important, you know, especially with I mean, that's the one thing like with the people that love Fallout. I mean, that's their big fear, right? Because, you know, with Fallout My big stuff, fear yeah. is that uh, you'll give it to Bethesda and then they'll ruin the franchise. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, so I know everybody's fear is that, is that the story gets lost and the depth and, and the really the deep cause and effect. That's what people loved about Fallout. That's what they love about Wasteland, which is that I can make some change and it's going to ripple maybe an hour from now, maybe 10 hours from now, and it's going to be meaningful. Not like a magician's trick where it just gets you back to the same place. And and I've said many times, in order to pull that off, you have to be committed to creating a bunch of content that no one's going to see, right? Because because otherwise there's no true cause and effect. And so sure. I think that's that's painful in some ways, right? Which is you know the writers have got all this wonderful stuff they put together, knowing a third of the people will never see it, right? Because that's just the way it is. But when you do have it happen, and of course it feels organic when you're playing, right? Because let's say you've made a choice, you've made a choice, you've made a choice, and now you've seen this new stuff. Well, you don't know that you couldn't have not seen that stuff because the choices you made were natural to you, right? And you're just in this area. And so, it, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny thing as a playthrough. Then you talk to your friend and go, hey, how about the, you know, how about the song and dance number? And you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, you know? And then you have to like back in to figure out how it is that you saw that and they didn't. And so that's what makes the, the deep role playing games and the stuff that people really want from from the kind of the fallout and wastelands. 
I'm, I'm just miss the narrative in Fallout. <laughs> that's, that's, it's like, give me the days of Obsidian. Give me the days when, when the writing was real. Give me the days when the environment was all encompassing. But the, yeah. this, this podcast has, has heard that a million times from me. So <laughs> I don't need to go into it. Um, I, I know that we're, we are actually getting pretty close to uh, new Fallout and ye old West Virginia hokey doke times. What was the thought behind setting this in post-apocalyptic Colorado? Well, I think that we, I mean, we had already done two that were pretty much in the Southwest, right? right. And this one, a little bit of Vegas, a little bit of, you know, Los Angeles. But we thought, you know, we didn't want to do another desert scene. And so we thought, how could we mix it up and make it visually different? Mm. And then also we started uh, thinking about Colorado and the, that NORAD and, you know, what was up there, you know, Cherokee Mountain, or no, 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 the name's escaping me, but, but you know, the, the, the nuclear facilities that are up there, the, the, the shelters. And then on top of it, we started thinking about tactically, what could we do with the snow that could make it interesting, uh, VFX, seeing people's, their breath, you know, as they walk around. And so we thought that we, could, that we could, we wanted to use it to make it feel very different than what you had experienced before. So, so that really drove that part of it. And the more research we did on that area, and the freakier it was, the more interested we got in it too. Nice. Like the hotel from The Shining is up there, right? So, you know, right. Um, so there's some really freaky stuff up there that we thought, okay, this is a good area. Um, so vehicles mounted, well, with weapons that you can actually use in combat. Yeah, that should be fun. Well, you know, if, if you think about post-apocalyptic films, yeah, they're Mad Max, a vehicle, do it. Mad do Max, it. right? So we thought. God, it's, you know, for post apoc RPGs, you know, they, people really haven't done much with vehicles other than some action-oriented uh, post apoc games, right? So so that aside, but from a, you know, more uh, turn-based, uh, nobody done a lot with vehicles from the storytelling. So um, we like that because they could both have offensive and defensive capabilities, right? So, you know, you whether you're fast traveling, but like you said, you, you, can, you can get up on your gun and just mount it up and, you know, blow the hell out of them or you can hide behind the doors and use them for defensive cover so we thought there'd be tactically some fun stuff to play with there it's like how many honey badgers will we effectively be able to eliminate with these weapons that are mounted on on vehicles it'd be great we'll just have to make bigger honey badgers ah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm looking forward to it um is it quarter four 2019 estimated yeah. delivery yeah yeah Excellent. yeah yeah, no, they're making great progress. And yeah, you said you like narrative. I mean, a lot of the writing yes. team who was on <laughs> Torment is on this product. And, you know, George worked on Fallout New Vegas and right. Chris, you know, and Chris Avalon. And, you know, we got uh, we got we got a super writing team on it. I love Chris. I had to educate some people who were watching my E3 stream on who Chris was when he came out. I'm just like, I'm like, go and read a book. Do some. I don't know. It's like, I don't. How, why do I have to tell you who these people are? You should know. <laughs> Yeah, Chris is great. He's he's our he's our eccentric rock star. Oh, of course. So, what are your thoughts? I guess if I can get a little bit in there, what what are your thoughts on on Fallout coming out, the new Fallout stuff? Do you have any opinions uh, on it? Well, gosh, you know, I I, I, I get asked that a lot, and I, I don't oh, want do to, uh, mm. to to well, I don't know. I I guess I I'm all for experimentation, so. You know, uh, I, I guess I, I you know, l let's see how it feels, really. You know, I mean, clearly it's not what the what the fallouts were born to be. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I understand the kind of the reaction to that. I don't think it's going to make future fallouts stop. Right. So so it's not that they're going to go away. Uh, they want to experiment in a new category with it. You know, let's see how it feels. Hmm pretty unbiased <laughs> i wish well, i could be that unbiased <laughs> i mean i think that's the best it's the best way to view it, it because i think most of the negativity around the games like release is just people they want they're so passionate for the franchise they want the game that they want I know. and you know it's not that and they're just like oh but i wanted this it's like well you haven't even played this one yet so like chill out <laughs> give it a yeah. minute <laughs> yeah, people, they will, I mean, you know, yeah, because they'll say, well, why didn't you put your efforts to just giving us another Fallout 5? You know, you know, why, you know, why are you doing this? But 
Sure. It could be different teams, different dynamics. You know, you, you don't want, you don't, you know, how, how fast you want to do it in between sequels. You know, there's consideration time, you know, so there's a lot of different things. But I, I, I have to say when, when, when Fallout 4 came out and I saw the, the uh the shelter building i went okay i know exactly where this is going oh yeah <laughs> as soon as i saw that i'm like okay this i know mm-hmm. i know what's happening here yeah we all knew what was happening there <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, what else have you guys been playing lately anyone else playing anything new um i tried out battle right royale ah um i actually really liked battle right mm-hmm. on its own uh, which is a 3v3, I think, in like a small arena, um, a top-down game. And uh, Battle Ride itself was really fun, but I don't think it ever really took off. Um, and so they've done what, you know, a lot of companies have done and uh, took the exact same concept but made it a Battle Royale. Um, there are some aspects to it that remind me of the, fuck, what's the Battle Royale game that was, like, Realm Royale. Oh, okay, um, gotcha. The one that was like very like magic like fantasy based right uh they did some things with it that remind me of that like um you you find um like spheres that you break and inside will be abilities and you can grab like the abilities and um and it'll stack so say that you have like the base form of that ability if you find you can find like a better version of it and uh and have like a leveled up version as long as you find it um, so it tries to sort of replicate in other battle royale games when you have better and better armor, you know, you can have better and better versions of your abilities. Um, so right now it's only duos, so you can only you can play with like one other person. Mm. It's like surprisingly very difficult because it it's difficult in the, in a way that reminds me of playing a MOBA. Like, like when I'm in combat, I feel like I'm suddenly playing like league or something where, I, I run out and I get overwhelmed like instantly if I don't know what my <laughs> abilities do or how to use them properly, you know. Um, but the game does a good job of saying like, these are characters that are more beginner friendly, try using them, you know. And uh, everybody does like very different things, but it's, it's pretty fun. I think it was um, 15 teams to start. So you start with 30 people. So it's not huge. The games don't take super long, um, but, but playing it, just in general, it feels it feels nice to play. I just need to be better with anybody, <laughs> <laughs> any character. I need to be better with literally any character. I know uh, that feeling. It's like this. Sh- yeah. This probably shouldn't play. This it shouldn't feel this bad when I'm playing. It's probably just that I suck, and right. I, I get that. That's why I don't really uh, talk too much about MOBAs because I always feel that way. It's like I've voice yeah. acted in MOBAs before, but I still can't play them. I just I'm horrible at them. Yeah, I've always been really bad at MOBAs. Um, but nothing oh, quite, uh, nothing quite like getting yelled at when you're not playing well either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like why aren't you uh, playing this? The other thing that I don't think I've seen in any other Battle Royale game is you can resurrect the other person. So it's only on the outsides of the map, but as long as it's like kind of early in the game, there will be resurrection areas that are available to you. So if you if like you and your buddy get into a fight and you're able to escape and they die, you have the possibility of bringing them back in the early game. Um, but you have to like seek out the resurrection spot um they have like these these like wind tunnels that you can step onto that will shoot you up in the air and you can try to like get there a bit quicker but then people can like you know if you if you land and you're next to people then you're kind of like hosed but um yeah there there there's some interesting parts to the game for sure and i i did really like battle right so it's fun to have a reason to play technically battle right again you yeah, know but i, but I don't a bit think, fresh yeah yeah but it is like a separate game so if you have battle right. right already it's not like a new game mode it's like a separate thing i'm trying to remember i'm waiting for teletubbies royale <laughs> it's oh, coming yeah, it's, it's happening out. i mean it, it's just a matter of time right yep tinky winky a little overpowered but that's fine that's yeah. fine <laughs> that, that and that purse is too much yeah it's <laughs> Yeah, all the accessories you have to buy, and all that, all those add-ons and microtransactions, <laughs> terrible. That's uh, terrible. No, it's just not right. 
Um, I have been, I feel like I'm, I'm just literally ticking boxes here for, for Brian, but, um, I have been playing a lot of the Bard's Tale trilogy remaster, uh, Bard's Tale 1 has been remastered and that's available now. And the second and third one are like coming soon. I want to say. Number two is like any day. Any like day. Any, oh, any wow. day for number two. Yeah. So I, 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 you actually remind me I'll have to check into that, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's imminent. I know, I, I believe. And then the third one before the end of the year. Yeah, that's mm. gotten a great response. People have really yeah. loved to have gone back and and the guys that did the uh, conversion did, did a super job with. Is it with, Chrome? Uh, yeah, Chrome. Chrome yeah, did they, it. they really they, they did an excellent excellent job. Uh, the one thing so, I, I will say is I, I definitely as soon as I had received um, the key because it was graciously sent to me. Um, I got my graph paper thinking this is going to be another day. <laughs> um, no, auto mapping. What is this auto mapping? Auto mapping in my game. I... Um, you know, people people forget that by the time Bard's Tale 3 came out, we had auto mapping. I know, but this is Bard's Tale 1. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you know. But I hear a legacy version is coming out, so that way yes. my graph paper won't go to complete waste. Yeah, um, no, we, we don't want to. We don't want to. <laughs> Go ruin that for you. Yeah, um, but I, I just did just want to let people know that it is available and that um, there are some quality of life changes that have been made to the game that actually make it a much better experience than it used to be. Like way back in the day, I'm trying to think of like what I originally played Bartel on. Was that like Commodore 64? I can't Probably. Even remember. Yeah. I think I think that Probably. was what I originally played it on, and. Obviously, the graphics have you know gotten a huge update. It's like no more black and one well, and green. Although I, I miss my days of black and green, but um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's still as fun as as it was back then. Nobody is safe. You're never safe. Doesn't matter if you're in the middle of town. Your guild's there. It's like no, mm -mm, you're never safe. Things can ambush you. It's great. I love it. Yeah, you know it. The the it's funny the things that you can get away with with those old games that you can't do today you know that like you know as you know with that game you know we, you could spend i don't know half an hour creating your six party members go yeah, outside re the door, and re and we just and we just kill you right on the spot like right when you get out right and so you there's a half an hour gone and then if you want to save the game you have to you know you have to make it back which yeah. you could also lose another hour there if you do that with modern games, you know, you'd be crucified, right? Oh, but yes. <laughs> because it's a throwback, you know, you're allowed, allowed to, to, to do that. that. That was kind of a debate, you know, we had with Bard's Tale 4, which was like, okay, we wanted to create a friction, right? We're not going to make you go all the way back to the guild the same. People would kill us for that. But we didn't want to allow you to save game anywhere because uh, you'd save scum it and there wouldn't be the risk. So that's why we did the save points. But... Those turn out are very controversial because some people go, "I want to save game anywhere <laughs> because that's the way I the games work today." And so it's always that, that's a that's a, that's always a rougher as a creator, right? You're like, okay, we want to create a certain tension by doing it that way, but on the other hand, if people only want to play games that way today, then maybe you have to give up on that tension or put it in a different mode. Right. So. So, so like for example, like that's something to do over again. I probably would have, I probably would have sucked it up and said, okay, fine, I let him save game anywhere, right? But, <laughs> but we, we, we wanted to create that tension. But so anyway, that that's sort of a. You made me think about that when you talked about the original series versus new and trying to bridging those worlds together. I, I think a lot of us, uh, we we do talk about this occasionally on the podcast. How when when remasters are being done, it's like, oh yeah, well we love the nostalgia. And, and Jesse almost always brings up the point: you think you love the yeah. nostalgia, you wait and you get it, and you think that you're you're getting what you want, and it's like, no, actually, I, I am spoiled by modern gaming. That's um, not to say there aren't some games that. When you go back and play them, you're like, oh my god, this was as good as I remember yeah, it. Yeah. But yeah. for the most part, when you go back and play an older game, you're like, oh, oh wow. No, this was just <laughs> I know. kind of like when I needed this game and it stuck with me. And I'm like, all right, I should have kept it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, I appreciated how um, Bard's Tale Remastered actually felt, uh, well, one, like Bard's Tale, despite auto mapping. Um, <laughs> I'm never going to let it go. Um, but the fact that it felt DOS era without literally being DOS, <laughs> it was Christ. nice. So I appreciated that. 
Um, yeah, I think it was the perfect blend, the, the way yeah. that what they got in. Yeah, I agree. Agreed. Okay. Um, I did want to touch on probably the game that I think probably the majority of the people watching might have played over the weekend. Some Life is Strange episode. Well, uh, Life is Strange 2 episode 1. Both mm. you and um, and Jesse played it, right, Brooke? Yes. I'm going to be right back. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, we, we played it together for Jesse's channel. Um, awesome. With the first game, I had originally played it on my own. And then when Jesse played it, he was like, hey, do you want to play this with me? And so now we're like kind of a Life is Strange duo. So <laughs> like he was like, when are you free? We're doing this. Yeah, sadly, you are now stuck. You're stuck here. That's I'm fine. so sorry for you. Yeah, it's fine. Um, so yeah, Life is Strange too. I have played. I haven't finished episode one yet, uh, but I have some thoughts, and I'm mm -hmm. sure you guys have some thoughts too. So let's get into roads, shall we? Uh, it, um, yeah. It definitely it. It, fe it's, it feels like another Life is Strange game for sure. <laughs> um, but I appreciate that like the dynamic is totally different, and I like that um, that it took. It took things that we were trained to do in Before the Storm and the original Life is Strange and skewed it for new characters. Um, so like in Life is Strange, you took pictures because Max is a photographer, right? And right. Before the Storm, you put graffiti all over the place because Chloe's a degenerate, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I liked that it, it took you already thinking about those. Like what you're already... Like, I think really early on when we started the game, I was like, what's the collectible in this game? Like, we need to figure <laughs> that out, like, now, right? So that we don't miss anything. Um, and, and yeah, they have a collectible system, like, for, for this. And it feels like it would only work with these characters and in oh, this situation. Yeah. So, sure. uh, yeah, so I, I appreciate the ways in which they change it up depending on who you're playing and like what the subject matter of the game is. Um, yeah. Um, subject matter wise, uh, I mean, God bless if you're for the wall. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> oh, this is man. definitely a slanted game. Like it that's is. just the way it, it has a political view. This game, this one. It is it a does. very like, political game. Yeah. yeah it even says like it there's even a scene where one of the characters is like, you know, I'm not even into all the politics and mm -hmm. a character Brody's like, everything's politics, dude. I was <laughs> like, Oh, all right. Here we go. Good luck. Good luck. If you, this is not your vibe. So yeah. um, that is it is all over it. But it has to do with like from Jump Street. This is a game about uh, like an immigrant family. Although I guess the boys are born in America. I but, think they are. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the the mom is out of the picture. Who knows where she's at? The there is literal police violence. I mean, like it is. Good luck, y'all. Good luck. If this is if it's not your jam, you're not gonna be down with this one. I think I think the political slant on things is actually probably the one thing that left a bad taste in my mouth because it was so black or white in the situation. Mm -hmm. It is either, oh hey, the you know, the liberals are the good guys and anybody who's anything else, bad guys. There was no in between. There was like no no in between. It no gray area for that at all. I, like I tried to find that too. Uh, I couldn't a scene, feel it a as a libertarian involving... and as an independent. I'm just like I just felt like okay, so there's no, we don't exist. Like, <laughs> we just like don't. there's a scene involving a guy who I think would probably be the libertarian dude in this yeah. game. Um, and the entire time I was like looking over at Dodger, I'm like, you know what? There's, I feel like this could be a David character, and that. Mm -hmm. The way they're portraying him is he's like a hard ass and he's like, you damn kids, I know what you did. And uh, like, this is why we got to build the wall, like that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, he's coming off as an asshole. Yeah. But everything we've learned about him pri like going into the scene mm, from his wife, you're like, oh, well, he doesn't seem like an asshole. So I feel like this. it was one of those like, Life is Strange David moments is what I was trying to get. And then the more the scene went on, I was like, oh, no, he's just a dick. <laughs> yeah. No, he's just a piece of shit. I was like, okay, that's how they portray this guy. But I felt like there was there was a lot going on there where it could have been like, all right, sure, maybe. I don't know. No, but the more it went on, the more it went through the scene. I was like, no, he's just like a scumbag, this guy. So I don't – yeah, it's definitely um, 
I don't know. Clearly, by the way, clearly, Chet, not cool that I'm using the word libertarian to describe someone who wants the wall. My bad, <laughs> everyone. I literally don't care. <laughs> literally do not care. Yeah, I was going to say, we don't want the wall. <laughs> um, no. Um, but I, I, I again, uh, I think it's, it is brave, I guess, to, to take a political slant in your game. Um, I just, I, I, I haven't really read too much about Life is Strange 2 without hearing about the political slant. And that's the concern I have. I'm not hearing about the game being good or bad. I'm hearing nothing but politics about it. And that is drowning out all of the reaction. It's like that that is probably what this game is going to be known for more so than the story, more so than the dynamic between the brothers. And it's a it's a harrowing beginning to a story. You know, you are suddenly uh, in a situation with your brother and in a situation that you should at that age not find yourself in and you are responsible and you, you are think, the caregiver. <laughs> I think the they by not addressing it, they would do themselves a disservice. I think mm -hmm. if you're if your two main characters are gonna be the two sons of a Mexican immigrant and it's gonna like the story is going to involve uh like police, like the whole thing if you're gonna start, that's your basis for starting by not including modern day politics, you're doing a disservice to the world that you're trying to set up. And right. so even though my assumption is that's not gonna be even remotely related to what happens in the future based on kind of knowing what like the vibe is, but it sets up the world and says like, this is 2016 and this is our 2016. And this is what 2016 was like. And everyone was yelling at everyone and it's still happening. And this is like the plot we're creating, like to, to cover that all up with like, it's fine. It was Seattle. And like, they were thinking maybe smoking weed would be cool. Like they, you can't, you can't do that. So I feel like even though a lot of the reaction is less about what's going on in the episode and more about like, oh, my political beliefs are being slandered in this game. Um, I feel like it's one of those things that, that if they hadn't done that, it would be uh, not as effective of a story because you sort of like, oh, I get what, what they're saying here. All right. Even if you disagree, you're like, okay, I understand what this is. So I don't know. That's just my point of view. Mm. Well, for this just being episode one, I think that was just – I mean, you're right, you know, when you're establishing, you know, a world, you do need to start with that out right in the front. Otherwise, you know, coming back to it in episode two or three, that would have been weird. <laughs> like, definitely get it going out of the gate if you're going to do it at all. I just found it very, I think it could have been done more subtly, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And I get that the the problems that, um, you know, people are facing, especially, you know, in, in, particular the characters of this game you know to them yeah it's probably not something that deserves subtlety or anything like that but i just feel like in in the world it just made it it kind of like broke the wall for me if you know what i mean like it's just i was immersed and then i was taken right out of it in, in just like a second because of the lack of, of subtlety because i just didn't feel like they would have reacted the the same way i don't know if that makes sense it just seemed well, what reaction too on like the in nose. what way which um, reaction without just, spoilers oh yeah th and that's the problem is like without spoilers <laughs> yeah it's hard to talk about yeah it really and, is I'm saying um, without spoiling stuff so i'm just like hmm. some of the stuff was actually in the beginning um in the very beginning i can kind of talk about that cuz i've showed a bit of it on the screen already um basically when our main character is walking home from school and he's crossing over into the bully's yard basically you see the <laughs> american flag in the same frame as this kid and then you see the letter you read the letter that's been sent to your dad and and you just start start to associate certain things and it's just like mm. it's like it, and initially like that should have been subtle but it wasn't to me well, you know I it's think, like you need I, I to build a fence we're gonna make you pay for the wall that's like immediately i was just like oh i'm being taken out of this way too I, I soon think, i think the the assumption that's set up there and even though this can be read as like oh it's really on the nose i think it's it sets up the reaction that he's like the kid's father is very much uh, like do not even trust the police like don't do like, like yeah. he 
has instilled this idea in the kids. So when everything goes down, their reaction makes more sense. And so I feel like if you have two young, a, a young adult, almost 16, and a child, and, and you have this idea of like, you've got nowhere to go. It pushes the story in that direction that makes the insanity of what happens a little more palatable, I think, gameplay-wise. You're just like, all right, I mean, I guess you. I guess it comes from, like, my life that I would be like, yo, i just go to the cops. But I guess if the and, plot... And me too. <laughs> I was just like, but why I, but, but again, I guess if the story is like, you know, you come from a different culture that they're, they're very much saying, this is what is happening in this right. household. Um, you can understand why they'd be like, God, no. No, that is the exact opposite thing I want to do. I think that's what they're trying to set up. I, I feel like um, it, it is what they've created is nuanced, but because it's such a big topic and like everything about it is on the nose because we're living through it right now and sort of like we see it with the perspective of like, oh my God, this is a real... It's not like a game where they aren't covering McCarthyism or some shit where it's like in the past and everyone sort of has the historical perspective on shit. It's everything happening right now. And so everyone is just emotional about everything. And so everyone's taking things that are happening in the game just like a little bit too like tensely. And mm. so they don't see perspective of what the storytellers are trying to do. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of things in the game where, where from like in my reality, I'd be just like, Oh no, I would not do that. I would not do that at all. But you just have to, you know, you're going on the adventure of what the story they're trying to tell. So Yeah. And and that's the thing is like, do you feel hostage to the story that they're trying to tell? They have, you know, the idea that, you know, choices matter, but the illusion of choice is something that we've talked about probably before in Life oh, is Strange sure. in general. Like there is no peaceful way out if they want you to have a <laughs> a, a plot point, turning point, you know, in the story, because that is the story that they've designed. Um at well, points, I, uh, I, mean, I haven't felt like that. I just, I'm, I'm putting it out there. I'm just asking if anybody else has felt that. I think way. it's always, it's all illusion, right? Like the mm -hmm. whole, they're telling you a linear story, and then at the end, you're probably going to get one of two endings, and then a bunch of little moments along the way are going to be different, and maybe there's a scene or two you will not see, right? But at the end of the day, it's Overall, just a story. Same story for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So I think like even even though you'll miss a thing or two, like there's a, a scene where they're building a camp for the night, right. and the process of getting to that scene is there's like four or five ways you can finish that scene. The way you can like get to them bedding down, and along the way there's a million little things you can do, and you can miss some. You can find others depending on choices you make. But at the end of the day, they're still gonna go to bed <laughs> under the stars. Like right. it's still gonna happen. But the, the way you get there can change. And the, the relationship between you and your brother can change. And I feel like that's the key to the game uh, is the, the, the brothers and how they react. And there's definitely 100%, at least so far, is a choice you can make throughout the entire game of how you play the older brother that affects the right, younger brother right. in a big way. And so I think that's that's an interesting thing to focus on when it comes to the mechanics of the game they've created. But yeah, I mean... It definitely this is a game that from Jump Street from the beginning is like we're gonna cover topical, political, yeah. <laughs> social issues. Get over it. And um the previous Life is Strange, I don't know how much it did of that. It definitely covered things like bullying and high school topics and relationships and friendships and love and all that stuff. But this one is is it is the start of a superhero adventure. <laughs> based in modern day reality mm. and i guess depending on how you view that reality uh and through which lens you view that in it can determine whether you're like down for this game and you want to see more or whether you're like that was a little much so yeah who knows I I just feel like the um, the original Life is Strange. I I mean, obviously, you know, you're given a setting, and sure, the setting could be like some suburb out of Portland. You know, why not? But it just didn't. It never because of the supernatural events that would take place. It never felt like a you know this real world. Sure, maybe a version of a real world somewhere, but it didn't seem as I don't know like real <laughs> to me. Um, so games for me are usually an escape. And I just didn't feel like I was really escaping much, diving oh, into this one. <laughs> we've had 
plenty of people in the comments being like, this is a little too close to home for right. me, which is totally understandable. But I do wonder if, um, I, th I think that it was Jesse who said it maybe, but I, I do wonder if this game is, if the, if the first chapter is gonna be much more heavily intense in that way to sort of yeah establish the up. world right create create like um a closeness between the brothers at the very beginning you know um if if that is going to be much more the tone of the first chapter and then from there it's going to feel a bit different because you know i think most people playing it do think that perhaps it's a it's a you know supernatural like power story right right um so i don't know it didn't it honestly when we were playing it it didn't there were moments that stood out to me as like ah there's that classic sure. life is strange dialogue right that's that is not <laughs> is not perfectly put together and and yeah maybe like lacks a lot of subtlety but it didn't it didn't feel too much like oof i'm having something shoved down my throat yeah. um and maybe that was because Jesse and I were together and kind of like conversing at the same time that we were playing it. But sure. um, it also, I guess, comes to to like. Let's be honest. It also comes to worldview too. Like I'm a I'm a West Coast liberal hippie. So I mean, like it comes it comes to your worldview as well. Whether you're like willing to accept the things that are being said. Like, well, of course that's going to happen here. And if you're not, you're like, what the fuck? Like, I get it. I understand what it's like. The problems people can have with the game. But it's one of those things that I think, storytelling wise, the things that they bring up are like, oh yeah, of course that they're they're creating this to tell the story to push to explain why the second half of chapter one happens, right? Because without that, it's kind of nonsense, right? right. Without setting up the like, of course they fear <laughs> the system because of X, Y, and Z, and we have set this up in advance, and I like get that, but you know, you know how it works. Um, oh, I'm, gl I'm glad we didn't put people in Bard cell chanting "build that moat." <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That would have been funny. <laughs> uh, the, I, I guess it is just literally the dialogue that got me. It's like you know when a character literally says, "You're the reason we need to build that wall." That just like I, I just at that point I was just like, "I'm out. I need to go and take a break and just right. come back to this because I just." It's just too emotional. Everything and, and games like this kind of already make you emotional because of the. The dynamic between the characters, especially, you know, you got two brothers interacting, gone through a harrowing experience. So you're kind of emotionally invested in what's going on with them. And then to see people treated like that, you know, you just like, mm. so it's just a, maybe a gut reaction for me. Um, but let's talk about, I guess, some of the more positive things, I hope. I really dug the inventory system this time around just because it's literally Us backpack too. the backpack yeah. is like the patches oh. on the backpack hanging things from your backpack as the collectibles and stuff i thought sure. that was really really clever um you know max of course had her camera and stuff but i just i feel like this is so much nicer it's like an upgrade that's the one complaint <laughs> i have i, I oh. it, it, yeah if i have to make a complaint about mm -hmm. the I guess it's like a god it's such a dumb complaint to have but it's it's the so max had her camera and yeah. so max her camera was the focal point of achievements and questing and all sorts yeah. of stuff in that game right mm -hmm. um chloe had tagging mm -hmm. so the tagging was the focal point of all the bonus shit and all the fun stuff that you would do and in the game it was just like she would go and tag shit and then right. it'd be like oh well to find achievements you tag other things right <laughs> in this one uh, Sean, the main character, his thing is drawing. And he'll sit down and he'll draw stuff. That plays no role <laughs> in any bonus content or achievements or anything. Literally, it just adds to your notebook and gives you a scene of him like, hmm, I wonder what I should draw. And he starts drawing. The drawing mechanic is fun because it like kind of feels like you're sketching it in the notebook, right? Right. But the actual bonus stuff, unlocking things to put on your backpack, unlocking stickers or whatever, has nothing to do with that. It's all random found stuff. It's you looked in the right place or you threw a stick the exact right number of times or things that do not reflect in any way. So the the when we finished the chapter, what I felt like after I was done was like all the bonus content, I had no clue how to get it. Only after finishing, I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of see what I was supposed to do. 
in previous Life of Strange Things, it was like Chloe needs the right shot, or uh, uh, right. Max needs the right angle for the right shot, and that's how right. you get that bonus. Max needs, or uh, Chloe <laughs> needs to tag a thing a certain way, or like move a thing to then tag a thing, right? But everything mm-hmm. related to stuff that was a, this does not have that at all, and I feel like that's a lost opportunity because the dude draws, so right. like make his bonus stuff drawing. Yeah. What is the? I don't understand why there's two separate things there. It's. It, I thought that was bizarre. Yeah. I just. I. I liked the idea that your stuff, you know, your patches and things were applied to your backpack because it's literally the, the only thing he has. Like that is that is everything that they have. And I just. I. I liked them utilizing it. But yeah. I. I totally get where you're coming from. I don't like missing mm. out on collectible things either. But. Then again, I used to play so many games where, you know, Easter eggs and collectible things were something that was not explained to you beforehand. So maybe I'm just a little more forgiving about that. Sure. (laughs) Of course. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, what else I wanted to talk about with Life is Strange. Um, The voice acting is great. The voice acting is great. Um, Although I do find that I, maybe it's just because I connected more with Max in the initial Life is Strange just felt like they were a more well-rounded character like you were introduced to max a little more thoroughly than mm. than initially than you are with sean because i feel like you you meet like what two people in the beginning um you know yeah you know and that's that's it whereas with max you know as soon as you got into the game you had an entire hallway full of people you had you know the dorms and the quad full of people and you went and you talked to them and you learned about them and who they were i felt like a big disconnect with sean in the beginning because there I, wasn't a lot of that i this think that a, isolation story though yes and and yeah, yeah. yeah. and i, I wasn't sure if that would be storytelling around them mm. sorry yep. no no absolutely no you're totally right i was just i just had the epiphany like of course the beginning of the first life of strange game is <laughs> you meet dozens and dozens of characters because it affects your decision making for the end of the first Life right, Strange right. game. And this one is like it's a story about two boys. Yeah. And you're going to meet two boys. <laughs> and uh, maybe one or two characters that influence the decisions, but it's about these two boys and how they interact with it. And so right. I and, and and the fact that it's about the two boys by the time you finish the end of the chapter, you're like, oh, I see why it focused heavily on the two boys because of their relationship infects the ending of this one. So, like, I get it. I get the game design there. So, I, at, that, at that point, it's just preference. Like, whether you liked the one versus the other. Yeah. Um, I, I also liked the update in graphics. We jumped up uh, an engine from 3 to Unreal 4 in that one. Mm. Um, so, most people probably wouldn't have even noticed <laughs> I noticed. I didn't. Not at all. I noticed all. everything. Um, but I, I thought that the um, AI was also well done for uh, Daniel as well. Like when you're out sure. and about and doing things, you know, having to kind of keep an eye on him, tasting things before he has them um, or him climbing on top of things or, or roaming around building like his his uh, Minecraft fort. Stuff like that was charming. It, it added to the immersion aspect and I, I thought it, it did a lot even though you know, they're probably just minor things to some people, background things. But um, I appreciated that they took the time to, to do that and not have stupid AI who literally, like, it, they could have literally done, you know, kid who follows you around. <laughs> it's like you turn around and there he is, stationary, w- waiting for you to do things. No, he, he does things, and, and I appreciate that in this kind of game. Um, but overall, I like the, the game. I just left a bad taste in my mouth on initial play through but you know probably go through back to it and hopefully get beyond that and yeah <laughs> where'd you guys end up like oh you guys finished it and what were like i guess overall like thoughts on on the end are you waiting for the next episode n- next yeah. installment or is I'm it i'm excited like, for eh? the next one because i think this whole this whole chapter was definitely like the setup okay right so I'm excited for chapter two. Yeah, they even they give you they literally give you a moment that that everyone involved when you see the scene for like the next time on a oh, song okay, gotcha. cue starts in your head, and everyone will have the exact same song start because it is super reminiscent of another huge fandom where you're just like, oh my god, is that is what going to happen? What I think is going to happen. So. <laughs> Uh, although I, yeah. I will say one final note, I, I could have dealt with that, with him not singing to the streets, like <laughs> at, in his room, 
It's like he puts on his iPod and what plays? The Streets. Like, oh my gosh, have we not? Like, what year is this? 2016 oh. is the year. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but even then, even, even in 2016, the Streets weren't any good. Come on. <laughs> Damn, I damn. Just, yeah, him singing along with it. I was just like, oh, no, 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 sweet summer child. No, <laughs> please don't. Um, yeah, so Life is Strange, uh, episode one out now. And yeah, um, I guess we should probably move on because we only have like 15 minutes left of what you guys are looking forward to playing. Are you guys you know, psyched for anything in particular? I want to know. I want to know what Brian's looking forward to playing. Like, what is yeah, on your right. radar coming down the pipeline? What are you jazzed for? I, like I was saying earlier, Red Dead Redemption Two. I mean, I, I you know it's kind of not very original since it seems like everybody's excited about that. But you know, anybody they spend years and years on these things, and they spend you know probably close to a hundred million dollars making these products, which by the way blows my mind when I think about <laughs> the original budget for Bardsell was thirty grand. So just to, to give you an idea of where we've come from. So anyway, but my point is that, that to, to see what they do and 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 the, and the kind of story they tell and and the sort of the, the detail, I, I'm I just I'm as as a as a creative person, I'm always awed by it, and I and I and I love to see what they do. So I mean, it, it, it it's it's top of my list. Right. I think for a lot of people, they're already slating this as their potential game of the year. They're just they're they're already like calling it, and they haven't even played it yet. They're just like everything i've seen it looks amazing well <laughs> I, I can tell you just you know what, what people don't really appreciate that aren't in the industry right which is how everybody's running from cover to get away from it who's in the business so if you have a right. title that's coming out around that time and i don't care whether you're you know activision or electronic arts nobody wants to be in the way of red dead i mean no. that's just okay. that, that's a weekly conversation about how stay out of their way so it, sure, it, you yeah. know it's a big deal when those guys are running <laughs> I, I i still i i definitely have that open world worry that i'll always have I that know. i'll end up like just being overwhelmed by nothing it's like a weird vibe to have where you're just overwhelmed by nothing really like nothing really happens so i'm hoping they've established like a really awesome balance of like you can always find stuff and always cool things happen and that if that's the key game's gonna be a hit I mean, it already is going to be, but it's going to be like bigger. Hmm. It's always nice to be surprised when you're when something's been hyped up so much, and then to get into it and then to actually blow you away. It's like we sit on pins and needles, sort of like waiting for it, waiting for it, but we're right. never allowed to like feel it because it never happens. We always end up being disappointed because we've hyped it up ourselves in our own minds so much. Sure. So I'm I'm really hoping that this just blows it out of the water and doesn't disappoint people. <laughs> I hear the same thing for uh, the new Assassin's Creed. Yeah, I hear yeah. it's I hear it's less like the last one, less like Origins, and more like Witcher, which is mm -hmm. I felt like the last one was like like Witcher. <laughs> same, so I, same. I'm interested to see how they're going to do this one because as much as I love ancient Egypt, and I really do, like the Greece, I'm in. I'm in for the whole thing. I'm in to play like a badass lady Spartan who's just like gonna murder some dudes. I'm ready. I want it to happen. So. That should be fun as well. And that's the fifth, I think. Uh, let's see. Is when that comes out? Fifth Actually, or third? Or... Let's see. How does I it guess goes? everyone, brother, if you pre ordered, you have it today or yeah, something. Yeah, they like have that. it today. That's what I was going to say. If you, I if ain't you doing did that. Gold, I'm not that excited. Shit. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the actual release date is on the fifth for that. Um,. The oh, yeah, new Mega... Lucius game is listed oh, now. Oh, yes. Yes, Lucius. It does. It doesn't have a release date. What? No. Time out. Time out. Why are you excited after you hated the last one? You the, both did you hate one the last was one? Fucking garbage. It was so bad, but I loved the first one. Like maybe this what? is really No, the what? third one could like be incredible. <laughs> this would be like me being hyped out for the new Fallout Ooh. game. Like that's where you are right now. <laughs> I'm so excited. I Look, I understand okay. I understand the one. premise of playing the devil and like Doing no, like an over movie for real no. life, but like <laughs> it's so bizarre. I get the the hilarity of it, but why? You hated the last one. Why yeah. are you excited? Well, the first the first one, it was like try to figure out how to murder literally everybody in the it's house. The omen, it's omen the game. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second one was just like it was buggy and it was awful the and AI like, was like the AI what? was terrible 
So this one, what if they're like, all right, like the the pictures, <laughs> the pictures what? go to so many different places, and I'm like, are we gonna murder everyone on Earth? What if? No. What? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Go play Plague Inc. And if that's what you want to do, go. Hey, go play I have been. Virus. I have been playing so much Plague Inc. That has been like my my iPad consistent thing like i have been i i'm actually like actively tweeting the devs it's like beat this beat that and beat the and they're just like okay well how about beat this and i'm just like yeah beat that and i'll spend all night beating the stupid stage that they're like what do you, you can't beat viruses? this on. i actually name almost all of them tb ah uh, <laughs> always it's already in the game like when it's like tb wiped out a million people i'm like Damn right you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes I'll actually name it Reddit. Um, <laughs> That's uh, true. Those are good goofs too. There yeah. may or may not have been a time I may have called it Bethesda. But anyway. I, I, don't, I don't know when a Resident Evil 8 is coming, but I can tell you that that is something I can't wait to play. I thought the last one was fantastic. I thought that, that scene around the dinner table was just so brilliant. It was like it, to me, the writers wrote, uh, watched a lot of episodes of Cops, I think, <laughs> when they put that together. I mean, have it you, was really well done. Have you seen this? the the footage or played any of the Resident Evil 2 remake? No. Oh, no. man. I'm is, so psyched for that. It is Resident Evil 2 with Resident Evil 5 gameplay mechanics with Resident Evil 7 graphics. Really? It is super huh. cool. I can't believe the people that can play it in VR. I, yeah. I just I, I couldn't it was it was intense enough you know to be in VR sitting at that table that would, that would have been overwhelming yeah they uh the original demo was called the kitchen for that and and rightfully no. so no no that was yeah. not okay that was yeah. not an okay experience yeah. it was not fun there it was they were like now sit down and put this VR headset on and I've never gone into any sort of appointment ever at e3 and Heard people around me screaming and been like, I'm not sure I want to do this. <laughs> like, it was yeah. not okay. Yeah. yeah that sucks. Yeah, no, that, that seems like the first time there'd be a VR heart attack, right? I mean, that was just where that, that was gonna be the experience. Yeah, no, that that was that was too much. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else of note that's coming down the pipeline. I think a lot of people trying uh, to Mega steer Man clear. eleven, if like yeah, you're I, down I was just gonna say that, Mega yeah. Man franchise. Mega Man eleven came out today. Um, <clears throat> we played and beat all of it already. Um, Whoa, nice. Damn. It is a solid, yes. like, if you're, if you can do Mega Man, it's like a short game. It's like three hours, maybe. Oh, okay. Um, but oh. it is, it's like a Mega Man that you would expect. It has your, your, your bosses. It has your, uh, you know, your little boss like tree and you go around and then Wily's in the middle. It has weapons as all the characters from the previous ones. Um, you're using the weapons. It, it's, very by the book tried and true is exactly what you would expect they didn't try to do anything crazy like with uh money number nine this one it straight up is like mega man except the only addition is they have a gear system now where you can uh charge up your weapon slow down time that kind of stuff uh and that's sort of like the mechanic of the game where it's like dr wiley's like my gears i put them in all the robots now and then mega man's like oh geez i have to have a gear system too and so that's kind of what it is it's it's uh mega man there's it's really not that crazy new it's exactly what you would expect <coughs> all right <laughs> um yeah. also out today let's see forza horizon 4 if that's your jam uh fist of the north star lost paradise out on ps4 um Looking through here, not really a whole lot else that I'm personally looking forward to. I mean, we could talk about how scary it is around Halloween time. We get Just Dance 2019, but... Oh, the yeah. scariest game of all. It is the scariest game of all. Every time we get ready for like an E3 coverage thing, I'm just like, oh, Ubisoft conference. Hide from Just Dance. Every year, it's, it's just... Oh, the cringe gets so real. I'd be lying if I said Just Dance, that area isn't popping every year. Every year, the it Ubisoft is. area is the most packed, and most people are sitting there enjoying themselves. So yeah, even though course. I personally am like, Just Dance is a plague on the world, doesn't matter, because the rest of the world's like, this shit is great. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to judge you on that. Enjoy. 
Uh, it's like we we have video of like uh, you and and John and and Brooke dancing. Uh, what was that Star Wars dancing game? That was, uh, yeah, remember. you mean the Connect Star Wars? Yeah, Star Wars Connect. Connect dancing yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, no. I was just like, I was like, so dancing games totally not out of the out of the factor for you, I guess. But I, I no, I never am really... according to BuzzFeed the thirteenth worst dancer in the world. So what? Wow. Amazing. You, you need like, to make the top ten though. I mean, come on, you gotta, you gotta be. You gotta, you gotta step good. it up. I really yeah, gotta I suck. I mean, you really, I gotta, really gotta get bad at this. <laughs> I I don't understand that at all. I think I think you can throw some pretty mad shapes, Jesse. Thank you, thank you. I try. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we are wrapping up here today. What's coming up on your channel, Jesse? What do you got going on this week? Yo, uh, Scary Game Squad's coming back, and to start more Scary Game Squad for uh, this delightful October season. There's an animated Scary Game Squad episode up right now, Ooh. right this very minute on the channel, and you can go watch the hilariousness of us uh, being the Scooby Gang for a little bit in our little animated form, and it's uh, very cute. So awesome. yeah, all that and more. And I guess uh, Mega Man 11 will be on the channel as well today. Nice. So that's that's it for me. Uh, what about you, Brooke? What do you have coming up on your channel this week? Um. Just kind of the huge, I guess. We launched the um, the Pixelmon server, so uh, that's like a bunch of different streamers all together. Um, so that's a thing. If people are on the whitelist, <laughs> they're able to join in, but they'll be coming in in waves. So um, got that going on, and still making my way through like Lamplight and some of the other games that I've been playing on stream. So. Yeah, if you want to follow me at Dex Bonus on pretty much everything, uh, Cat Gang Store also has a brand new shirt that is a, a, a holiday themed shirt of a big old demon with his new kitty, and it's Ooh, adorable. Spoopy. So, <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to check that out, please go to the Cat Gang Store on Yeti. And um, yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Come hang out. Um, I have actually been working on a few things that are coming in the pipeline. Um, Julian, who does the podcast animated, is working on some stuff for me. So I will be streaming in the near future. Scary. Oh. Yeah, making content. <laughs> um, I think he also might have said that we may have another co-optional animated. Maybe. Don't Sick. hold me to that. I'm hoping. We'll see. Uh, Brian, what do you have going on in, in your world? Is everything just gravy now that you guys have just wrapped up, you know, release? and Or is it just like all hammer all the time, got to get Wasteland 3 out? It's pretty much how it is. I mean, you know, you're always on the front lines of this business. As soon as one thing wraps up, you're like, okay, you know, Wasteland's like, we need those resources. Get them on over here. You know, and then there's like parts of that game that we haven't had to focus on because we've had to focus on Bard Still 4. So um, most of my time really is, in a, you know, we're working on these Bard Still 4 updates, right? Uh, that's that's a big part of our of our focus. And then Wasteland 3. I mean, that, that we are already, we already had a meeting about it this morning and, you know, <laughs> just loving what they're doing. So, yep, that's my time. Awesome. Staying here on the front lines. Well, I'm looking forward to more updates on Wasteland 3 because, I mean, I'm pretty invested <laughs> into that franchise. <laughs> and especially, like, when you take, you know, Planescape Torment narrative team and just drop them in on it, I'm just like, sold! <laughs> That's your jam. <laughs> That's my jam, 100%. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Brian, for joining us today on the Co-Optional Podcast. We definitely appreciated having you with us. Um, a lot of people were like, dang, how in the world did you get such a get as Brian Fargo? It's like, uh... Uh, amazing people. <laughs> no, no it, it's it's been fun. I appreciate you having me on. It's always you know, it, it's you know when 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 you're when you're making games, right? Mm -hmm. You're not ever talking about your history of making games, right? right. My friends don't want to hear it, <laughs> and the people around here are all talking about the future, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's it's kind of fun because I do get to reminisce a little bit when I do shows like this because it's not a normal conversation I get to have. Oh, so yeah. it's always enjoyable. Great. Cool. Well, I'm yeah. glad that you enjoyed your time with us. Um, thank you guys so much for, well, thank you, Brooke, and thank you, Jesse, for joining me today, as per usual. And no problem. Thank you, everybody who tuned in to watch to the live show. If you're watching the VOD, thank you so much for tuning in and watching it anyway. Um, 
yeah so that has been the co-optional podcast for this week hopefully we'll be back next week october does present some some difficulties with um you know halloween <laughs> i'm usually pretty busy around halloween i'm um, doing my star wars like 500 first legion stuff. From now. i know but I, I get asked out for all sorts of things they all want kylo ren to come to their halloween party who knows why um i also have some travel that may be booked near the end of this month Ooh. as well so We'll see if it, if it ends up being like a Kren optional podcast at some point. Well, I don't, I don't envy Great. Jesse those nope. weeks. <laughs> He's just like, no, I'm out. No, That's it. What's happening? All right. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. It has been a blast as usual. Um, and we will cool. see you next right. time. See you guys. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye. Bye.